Um, today we'll be talking about cervical IVDD, so appropriately named a pain in the neck. Um, I am Montana DeVita. I'm the third year resident here at Southeast Veterinary Neurology in Miami. Crazy that I'm, I'm already towards the end of my residency. Um, some of you may have seen me give this lecture towards the beginning of my residency and um, at the Seven Synapse Conference last year, I was able to give one about feline neurologic conditions. So um, if you have seen those, thanks for coming back. And if not, welcome. Um, before we move on, just a few housekeeping um, things to talk about. So um, for your CE certificate, that will come to you in your email about an hour after we're finished here. Um, and in that email will also be a template form for you for the neurologic exam. So just something that we utilize here that helps us to keep track of our neuro exams, helps us with localizations and coming up with differentials. Um, so hopefully that will be useful to you as well. Um, so take a look at that once you do get your CE certificate. Um, and obviously we have a lot of resources. If there's any anything that we can help you with from a resource standpoint, a pet resource or pet parent resource standpoint, um, please feel free to reach out because we're always happy to help. So um, again, today we'll be talking about cervical IVDD in dogs. There are a few different things we'll want to touch on. So first and foremost, what is IVDD? Um, then we will talk about what the clinical signs are, and, and that's folded because it's one of the most important parts of this talk, talk. And one of the things that I want you to get out of it is when should I worry about IVDD in my patients or for our pet parents, when should I worry about IVDD in my pets? We will talk a little bit about the treatment, um, a little bit about the prognosis as well. Um, and then I do have one case at the very end. I think last time I gave this talk, I wasn't quite able to get through it, um, but we'll try our very best to get to that one. Um, just a, a very brief case presentation. All right, so first and foremost, anatomy of the intervertebral disc. Understanding the anatomy is essential to understanding why this happens. Um, so on the left here, we have this picture. This is not a cervical vertebrae, so it's not a super representative picture. It's, it's more of a stock image, but I thought it was helpful. Um, and then on the right here, we have a jelly donut, um, and that is not because I am hungry. Um, that is because that is the analogy that I use to try to explain to pet parents what a disc is. Um, so you have your annulus fibrosis, that's your um, fibrous outer portion of the disc um, that kind of helps to keep things in place. Um, and that's what I equate to the donut part of the jelly donut analogy. And that consists of collagen fibers. And then you have your nucleus pulposus, that's your inner gelatinous or jelly-like center. Of course, in this analogy, it's the jelly of the donut. Um, and so the discs kind of sit between the bones of the spine. They act like shock absorbers, and that's their kind of everyday job is to act like shock absorbers and distribute the forces of everyday activity evenly. And they also play a role in, in stabilizing the spine. The nucleus, as you'll see here, does sit kind of more dorsally within the annulus. Um, so it's not centered, it's eccentric. Um, and so you'll see the annulus is a bit thinner on top of the nucleus. And so that's part of the reason that dogs can have disc extrusions. They have kind of less um, force or pressure to get through here on top than they do on the bottom. Um, you do have longitudinal ligaments as well. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, you have longitudinal ligaments as well, um, both dorsally and ventrally, that help to stabilize the disc. Um, and so that's kind of your, your general anatomy. In our chondrodystrophic breeds, um, the nucleus um, kind of occupies a smaller portion of the disc in the cervical spine. Um, so again, it's kind of more prone to extrusion. Um, so that's a, a good analogy. I feel like people do um, kind of get it. So I utilize it often and especially now that we're um, unfortunately still curbside, um, having that mental picture I think helps a lot of our pet owners to understand what we're talking about. Um, so the anatomy of the cervical spine, um, we all probably know this. So C1 or the atlas, you have the wings of your atlas here. There's no disc between C1 and C2. Your first disc is at C2-3. Remember, two has this big spinous process here. Um, and then C6 has your kind of transverse processes that are bigger, they're kind of wing-like as well. Um, so um, your um, nerves come out of the intervertebral foramen here, um, and sometimes you can get nerve root entrapment there as well. We'll see a picture of that or a few pictures of that later on in the talk. Um, and as a reminder, you have seven cervical vertebrae in dogs. 
you have eight cervical nerves, um, so they actually kind of come out, and C8 comes out back here, um, and then you start your thoracic spine. All right, and then this is just another kind of visual representation here. This gives us a better picture of the nerves and where they exit. Um, so our kind of talk today will be concerned with C1 to C5 and C6 to T2. Remembering that C6 to T2 is our cervical intumescence, so that's where the nerves that innervate the thoracic limb come off of the spinal cord. Um, C1 to C5 carries some of our kind of longer tracks from the legs to the brain, um, and so obviously we can have variable clinical signs depending on which segment is affected. Um, but we can also sometimes not be able to tell the difference on examination, especially if the dog has pain as the only presenting um, clinical complaint. Um, so I would keep all of your kind of localizations open unless they have very obvious C6 to T2 signs, and we'll talk about what that means in just a moment. All right, so what is IVDD? So IVDD, or intervertebral disc disease, is a degenerative process that is the predisposing factor for disc herniations. There are really three types of IVDD, two that we talk about commonly. Um, so Hansen type one is going to be our most common here. Um, in Hansen type one IVDD, the nucleus pulposus becomes dehydrated. Um, so when I'm using my jelly donut analogy, I kind of then compare it to a gritty toothpaste-like material because it comes um, just really friable. Um, Hansen type 1 is most common in chondrodystrophic dogs. We see all types of disc herniations in all breeds, but um, obviously our dachshunds, our shizus, our French bulldogs are going to be the poster children for Hansen type 1 disc disease. Um, and then basically it occurs because of a change in the press, pressure and force distribution on the disc. Um, so that'll lead to weakening of that dorsal annulus, remember that's already thinner. Um, and when that happens, eventually it can get so weak that there becomes a hole in the annulus um, and a rupture can occur. So it allows that now gritty jelly-like material to kind of slip out and put pressure on the spinal cord. Um, Hansen type two disc disease is less common, but we still see it um, mostly in our larger breed dogs. So that's a degeneration of the annulus itself. Um, the annulus will kind of protrude into the spinal canal during Hansen type two disc disease. Um, so it's not much of a rupture of the nucleus itself, but more of a protrusion and thickening of the annulus that causes the spinal cord compression. Um, and Hansen type two can affect um, the nerve roots and the spinal cord, just like Hansen type one discs can. And then lastly, Hansen type three. Um, so that's what we call a missile disc in here, or an acute non-compressive nucleus pulposus extrusion. So ANNPE, super long word. Um, but basically what that is, is when a small volume of disc material or, or of nucleus um, kind of ruptures at a high velocity, and it therefore, what I describe as punches the spinal cord and leaves a bruise. Um, so the high velocity causes a, a concussive injury, um, and then, you know, it just leaves this kind of bruise in the spinal cord, but no compression. Um, so that last type, Hansen type, type 3, is not... Um, going to be amenable to surgery. Thankfully, most dogs do get better. Just take some time and just like a bruise on your leg, you just have to give it some time to heal. Um, so this is just, again, kind of not a totally representative figure, but um, for the different types of disc extrusion or protrusion, so type 1 extrusion, type 2 protrusion, makes sense. Um, here you can see the nucleus kind of shooting through the annulus, which now has a hole in it, and putting pressure on the spinal cord. And then here you can see um, the protrusion of the thickened annulus. You can see how much thicker it is dorsally in this picture compared to the first one that we saw um, on the anatomy slide. And again, causing some compression of the spinal cord here, even though there is no um, kind of uh, extrusion of the nucleus pulposus. All right, so breed predispositions. Um, like I said, dachshunds, poster child, of course, um, French Bulldogs are arguably the most common dog that we see here in Miami. Um, they are pretty common in Miami compared to some other places that I've lived, so don't know if that's a kind of biased population, but um, certainly we see at least one French Bulldog every day. Shizu's, again, kind of one of our, our other ones, and other small fluffy breeds like Havanese, Pekingese, 
Um, chihuahuas, they love to get discs in their necks as well. Um, Yorkies are another one that I don't think are on this slide, but realistically, we can see any type of dog. So that's why you'll see here, we've got our doodles, we've got our pit bulls, we've got our rotties. Um, so really any dog can have a disc. It has to be on the list for any dog that comes in. Um, and when I'm talking to my pet owners, you know, I, I realize that in a larger, older breed dog, there may be some other things that um, may be a bit more sinister than a slip disc. Um, but realistically, we have to keep it on our consideration list because it's absolutely possible. And you'll see in this presentation, you know, there are a few large breed dogs who were older and who came in for walking difficulties or neck pain um, and ended up having a disc. And, and certainly that's a lot better than some of the other things that were on our differential list for those guys. All right, so clinical signs, this is probably the kind of more interesting, more important part of this talk. Um, so there are a lot of them. Pain is one of the most common that we see. Difficulty walking, of course, um, typically in all four legs. Um, so you can see weakness, you can see lameness, and you can see ataxia as well. Um, proprioceptive deficits are also possible. Again, usually going to be in all four legs. Um, head turn or, you know, kind of not wanting to move the head in one direction. That can be tough to differentiate from like a head tilt or a head turn because of a brain problem. Um, but obviously correlating that with the level of discomfort on your clinical examination, your cranial nerve examination will be important. You can have decreased or absent thoracic limb reflexes that will come with your more caudal, you know, um, disc problems in the neck. Um, so again, kind of uh, utilizing your clinical exam to know exactly where to look and where to be worried about. Horner syndrome, less common, um, but certainly can happen. And we'll talk about that and the kind of Horner's pathway and why that occurs. And then lastly, difficulty breathing. So you're only gonna see your difficulty breathing in the really severe cases. I do have a video of a dog who presented that way. Um, and you know, thankfully he did very well, but that's kind of our most serious clinical sign that we'll see with a dog with a slip disc in the neck. Um, so pain is our kind of first clinical sign. You can see this little, oh gosh, this little dachshund here um, is in quite a bit of pain. So you'll see them have this really low head and neck carriage. I like to describe it to my pet owners as, you know, they'll look up with me only with their eyes. Um, so even if I hold a treat or call out their name, they won't move their whole head and neck upwards. They'll just kind of gaze up at me, moving their eyes to the ceiling instead of their head. Um, lots of them can spontaneously cry out. Um, so that might be something that the owners report to at home is that he just all of a sudden starts screaming out of nowhere. Um, freezing in space is another one. So kind of, you know, walking along and then suddenly stop and don't want to move. Um, I mentioned that one and the spontaneously crying out because lots of owners will come to us with a history that their dog is having seizures. And in conjunction with the muscle spasms that you can sometimes see when a dog has neck pain, um, it can be pretty difficult to suss out for a pet parent who, who doesn't have a, a neck problem on their list of, you know, what they're thinking about or what they're looking for. So asking those historical questions, even showing examples are is sometimes helpful. And again, in conjunction with your clinical exam um, so that we can suss out, you know, what part of the nervous system is affected and what are the potential causes and what should we do for this pet. Um, kyphosis is another one, so arched back posture. That's another one that gets confused pretty often. Owners will come to us and say they're arching their back, they must be painful in their back, um, but we know that that can be a sign of neck pain. So again, just correlating with your clinical examination. Um, and then change in behavior, of course, if they're lethargic, they don't wanna eat, they don't wanna get up and go, go move around, they don't wanna go on the couch or on their bed um, if it requires a step up. Um, so. All of those historical questions are things that you might not see in the hospital, but things that are going to be very, very important to ask your pet owners. So this little guy here is Maui. Excuse me. <coughs> Maui was a young French bulldog that came to us for neck pain. He had all of that history of not wanting to go up and down the stairs, um, panting, crying out spontaneously. He was reluctant to walk or move and you know he was historically a very active hyper three-year-old french bulldog just like we all expect them to be um, so you can see here um i turned off the sound so you don't hear him panting but you can see how much he's panting he has that kind of head turn um to his right side there and you can see just kind of how still he's staying he's looking around with his eyes instead of his whole head and neck 
you can see I'll play it once more and I've got one more video of Maui there um, just to give us an example on the next slide here. Um, so in this, this just gives a different angle, kind of the same day. Um, so you can see how low he's holding his head and neck. Um, even though it's not all the way down to the ground, he kind of doesn't really want to pick his head and neck up. Um, he's very guarded. He did have some muscle fasciculations, if I remember correctly. This was a few years back. Um, but Maui did have a slipped disc um, at C3-4. He had a ventral slot. Um, so thankfully, he recovered quite well and is feeling very well. Um, but, you know, obviously, his clinical signs were, were quite apparent that he was very uncomfortable there. Um, and so he had an MRI that same day and was doing better. Um, so the spinal cord itself doesn't have pain receptors. Um, there are three different types of pain that we think about when we have IVDD. Um, so the first is discogenic pain, and I will kind of pull up some pictures and, and try to explain this. Um, so discogenic pain is because of the rupture of the annulus, which is innervated. Um, so sometimes we can have dogs who are in pain and we do an MRI. We don't find anything exceedingly compressive. Um, so discogenic pain is difficult to prove, but one that's certainly possible. It's well described in humans, not as quite well described in dogs, um, but again, certainly possible. Meningeal pain. So um, the meninges themselves can be painful due to the mechanical direct contact of the disc. Um, and there can also be kind of inflammation secondary to the body's reaction of the ruptured um, nucleus, kind of pressing on the meninges. So um, that's probably the more common type of, of pain that we see compared to discogenic pain. And then lastly, radicular pain or nerve root entrapment, basically. Um, so pain due to the impingement of nerve roots. I think the next slide here has a pretty good picture of that. Um, so all of those are possible. And then I have um, some photos here that help to um, kind of differentiate those. Um, so here you'll see kind of the disc um, and the annulus, again, kind of normal anatomy. Um, but when you have disc pressing on these meninges here, um, you can certainly, you know, certainly get a little bit of discomfort. Um, and then here, again, so normal anatomy on the right here. Here you see this um, disc kind of squirting up. And again, this is a, a human image, so not totally representative of a dog, but um, kind of squirting up and, and impinging this nerve root here. So you can see in the picture on the right how, um, you know, kind of freed up it is. You see a little bit of disc material there, which is, I think, what, what they were trying to get at. Um, but here's a much more profound. You can see there's some meningeal contact there, um, you know, just surrounding the spinal cord and then the spinal nerve here um, being kind of compressed. And so um, those are some of the most common types of, of slip discs we see in the neck and the most common cause of discomfort. So you see here on this CT scan, this is kind of uh, more normal on the left side here. Um, CTs are not going to be our primary imaging modality, but this was just a really good example. And then as you start to get to this intervertebral foramen here, oh gosh, what have I done? Uh, here we go. Um, sorry, I lost my, my images there um, a little bit. So um, as you start to get to this intervertebral foramen here on the image in the middle and on the right, you can see this bright, um, and this would be this kind of degenerate nucleus in here. Um, and that's where, if you remember, the nerve roots are coming off. And so presumably the nerve root that's in there is quite compressed, quite uncomfortable. Same in this picture here on the right. Um, you can see even more um, that the, you know, the nerve root will be um, kind of pressed on and compressed there. So um, quite a significant lateralized disc extrusion in this dog. Um, he was quite painful. And, and so we did have to go in surgically and remove that. I'm not sure if y'all can see the shifting back and forth here, but my computer's not, not quite participating the way I want it to. Hopefully you can't see that. All right, moving on. Um, so next potential clinical sign is going to be a nerve root signature, root signature. Um, so that's going to be a holding up of the thoracic limb or uh, a thoracic limb lameness. This can be difficult to, to suss out um, compared to an orthopedic, you know, cause of lameness. And so, again, that's where your clinical exam comes in so important, so important to help us differentiate between the two. Um, again, the root signature is due to pathology of the affected nerve root um, and um, can be seen more with kind of caudal cervical IVDD. So, again, where all of those little nerves are branching off and innervating the thoracic limb. 
Um, and it can be also be appreciated when there's um, kind of traction of the limb, the dog will appear to be in pain. Even if there's not neck pain on direct palpation, um, that's one of the ways, again, to kind of suss out where is the dog painful. Um, and these will be due to a lateralized compression, just like we saw in the last images there. Um, so this little kid, you can see um, not only, so here we have this kind of freezing in space, holding up the limb. Um, so a bit of a combination of our clinical signs there. And then moving on and you know you'll see i think that he does it again where he just holds up that left thoracic limb one more time we can go through um so again kind of the stopping freezing doesn't want to move doesn't want to turn his head holds up his left thoracic limb um and then kind of once the pain subsides presumably he had kind of a spike of pain there and um, he just kind of stops and moves on so this little kid as well is much more severely affected. You can see that he you know, is pretty happy little guy, um, seems pretty bright alert, doesn't seem exceedingly painful, but just will not put that left thoracic limb down. Um, and so this guy did have a slip disc as well. Um, and you can see it's pretty significant. Um, if I remember, he was pretty painful when you kind of pulled um, that left thoracic limb back just a touch, but um, very profound uh, root signature there. Um, so always keep that on your list, not only an orthopedic problem when a dog has a lameness in the thoracic limb, but also a neurologic problem. Um, so next, hyperreflexia. Um, this is another one that's going to be important, especially when we're sussing out orthopedic versus neurologic. Um, so the loss of thoracic limb reflexes will occur with a caudal cervical lesion. Um, the withdrawal reflex, the biceps tendon reflex, and the triceps tendon reflex. Um, frankly, we test the withdrawal reflex most commonly here. It's um, kind of one of the ones that we're most comfortable with and is most reliable in terms of clinical examination. The biceps and triceps can be a little bit more difficult to elicit. Um, so uh, the nerves involved are the median ulnar musculocutaneous and axillary nerves. Um, and those all kind of exit the cervical intumescence there at C6 to T1. Um, so again, kind of caudal cervical lesion, you know, cranial thoracic lesion. Um, so for the withdrawal reflex, you have to remember to differentiate pain from the reflex. Um, so when you are kind of pinching those toes and remember you're pinching the webbing of the toes or the toes themselves to try and get um, the dog to pull back, they should flex all of their joints of the thoracic limb. Um, you know, you have to remember just because they turn around and, you know, try to tell you to stop pinching them doesn't mean that they're withdrawing um, and vice versa. So just because they withdraw doesn't mean that they can feel it, um, which is typically less relevant in a cervical spine lesion, but um, potentially more relevant in a thoracolumbar, you know, slip disc. Um, so remembering to differentiate between those two and to look for flexion of all of your joints um, will be important. And then you have the triceps tendon reflex. Again, we don't test these super commonly, but you'll be looking for reflexive extension of the elbow um, after you kind of percuss the triceps. Um, and we have a picture of that on the next slide. Um, that indicates function of the radial nerve, which exits the spinal cord at C7 to C2. Um, and then the biceps tendon reflex. Um, so again, it's a slight contraction of the biceps on percussion. Um, it's very difficult to elicit. So again, we don't test it super commonly. Um, and is going to indicate function of the musculocutaneous nerve at C6 to C8. So again, all of those being kind of our more caudal cervical spinal cord. Um, and if those are normal, it doesn't completely eliminate a caudal cervical lesion. It just makes a cranial cervical or C1 to C5 lesion much more likely. Um, the more um, kind of um, dogs who, who present with only pain, so the less significantly affected dogs who aren't having trouble walking, I still consider a lesion up to T2 if they have neck pain alone, and I'll still look on my imaging at that entire, you know, kind of first part of the spine. So again, just some pictures of your triceps and biceps tendon reflexes. Um, that's just where you will percuss with your reflex hammer. Um, again, less important for, for me and, you know, in our training here um, than the withdrawal reflex itself. And remembering to check on both sides. Um, this is a good representation too of laterality. So and having the dog in lateral recumbency is going to be the best way to test its reflexes and the most reliable. You'll also want to make sure that they're um, nice and kind of relaxed. So when a dog is 
super um, you know, nervous and has a lot of sympathetic tone, it can be pretty difficult to elicit those reflexes. Um, so sometimes you'll just have to use a little bit of a stronger stimulus or get them a bit more relaxed in order to accurately evaluate those reflexes. All right, so moving on to our next kind of clinical sign. So um, weakness in ataxia. Um, so they can be tetraparetic or tetraplegic. Um, the front legs or the hind legs may be more severely affected, kind of depending on the location of the lesion. Um, but remembering that there can be a disparity between the two, that's one of the more important. Um, some of the thoracic limb signs can be pretty subtle. So crossing over in the thoracic limbs, you know, are certainly things that we look for. Um, scuffing at all, even if it's mild, and even if the, the pelvic limbs are more affected, um, you know, you still have to consider a cervical lesion if all four legs are affected to any degree. Um, appropriate receptive ataxia, so again, knuckling, scuffing, crossing over of the legs, um, certainly going to be one of the things that we're looking for. Obviously, we walk them, you know, kind of up and down a hallway on different traction surfaces, um, outside in the grass, inside on a nice high traction mat, and then inside on our tile floor as well. Um, you know, turn them around in circles too, because sometimes the more subtle proprioceptive ataxias will only be seen when you're kind of turning, you know, turning corners, turning circles. Um, so it will be important to kind of have a very thorough physical exam and neurologic exam, especially in those less severely affected patients. And then they can have a floating thoracic limb gait as well. I don't have a great example of this on video, um, but ju just this kind of, you know, millisecond before they put their thoracic limbs down during ambulation um, that looks like those legs are floating. It almost sometimes represents a cerebellar ataxia, um, but you don't have some of the other cerebellar signs in there. Um, so next time I see a dog with, with this clinical um, kind of presentation, I'll have to make sure to include that video in this presentation here. Um, but that's something to watch for. And then lastly, a two engine gate, which I have a really nice video of coming up. Um, so that's gonna be a short and choppy thoracic limb gate with this longer kind of loping strided pelvic limb gate. Um, and that's going to be with a caudal cervical lesion as well. And that's one of our kind of classic clinical signs. Um, and if you see Miss Candy here, Candy was a 12 year old female spade, um, American bulldog with this very acute onset, um, perfect example of history taking um, and neurologic exam being useful together. So the owners were concerned about a pelvic limb problem only. You'll see that her pelvic limbs are very obviously affected. Um, but on presentation, on examination, we noticed that her thoracic limbs were also very short and choppy. So I call them twinkle toes. They almost look like ballerina dancing to me where they're um, just really short strided in the front legs. Um, but you'll see here, and we'll play this one twice for you. You can see these long loping strides in the back legs with these really short strides in the front legs, almost like, like she's tap dancing. Um, and the back legs are just so much longer in their stride and in their gait. Um, I think she's got a little bit of scuffing. Um, I think on the right was more affected there. Um, and so she's pretty significantly affected. We'll play that one more time for you. Um, so again, this short strided thoracic limb, long um, pelvic limb gait, um, and she, she almost looks like she's skating there in the back leg. She's got such a long gait and um, definitely scuffs that right at least um, most of the time, most of her steps. Um, so Candy had a C6, C7 disc, um, and she also had surgery, and she wasn't painful. So, um, you know, that was also part of the, um, you know, kind of examination and, and being thorough in your exam is that she didn't have obvious neck pain. Um, now, she's a, a pretty big, beefy dog, so might just be that I wasn't strong enough to elicit neck pain, um, but she was, was not obviously uncomfortable here in the hospital. So um, pairing, again, her history, her clinical exam, um, and that more subtle finding was important for us to localize her properly and to look in the right place um, to, to find her slip disc. Um, as a reminder as well, she had delayed posture actions in the pelvic limbs, but not in the thoracic limbs. Um, so again, just putting her whole exam together. Um, this next video I've got here, this is Rowdy. He was an adult Rottweiler, maybe six or seven years old. Um, he came in for acute tetraplegia. Um, he also had a slip disc at five, six. Um, so you can see here, 
he's um you know floppy and all four um he's not really doing much there with with any of his legs you can see he's got absent posture reactions in all four of his limbs um i let the boys handle this guy because he was a big boy um but you can see he's just got got no motor function so obviously it's quite an emergent case one that we tackled that same day um, and you know did his MRI and did his surgery but perfect example of an older large breed dog who we say gosh this big guy is gonna have a tumor and then we're all surprised at the end of the day um, with good news that you know we have a pretty good chance of fixing him obviously with surgery um, but we'll talk about those treatment options down the line um, so moving on so Next clinical sign of IVDD, um, so Horner syndrome. This one's less common and a little bit more, um, you know, kind of uh, difficult to, to link with a neck problem if you don't know the anatomy, but that's why we'll go through it here today. Um, so as a reminder, Horner syndrome is, is made up of um, kind of four clinical signs. So meiosis or a small um, pupil on that side, ptosis or dripping of the eyelid on the affected side, protrusion of the third eyelid on that affected side and an ophthalmist or sinking in of the eye on the affected side. Um, you'll see Horner syndrome typically with a more caudal cervical lesion, although it can be with, you know, kind of any lesion throughout the, you know, the spinal cord and the neck. And you'll see the reason for that. So the Horner's pathway or the sympathetic pathway to the eye starts in the brain, travels down the spinal cord and exits the spinal cord at T between T1 and T3, kind of those segments there. Um, and then travels back, the sympathetic pathway travels back up into the eye. Um, so it is possible if there's a problem here in the neck um, that you will get a Horner syndrome associated with that slip disc. Again, it's not super common, not something that we see, um, you know, but it can certainly happen. And so definitely needs to be on the list. If you have a Horner syndrome in conjunction with neck pain, we've got to keep that on our list um, that this could be a slip disc. Um, so this guy here has a pretty profound Horner syndrome in his right eye. Um, you can't really see the pupil, but presumably just comparatively, you can tell that the pupil is going to be much smaller on this right side here. He's got that sinking of the eyelid. So um, if you look at the kind of palpebral fissure here, it's much smaller in the right eye than in the left eye. He's got elevation of the third eyelid. And the sinking in can be hard to appreciate. I think on this picture, um, it's pretty obvious that this eye is just more sunk in than the left. Um, but oftentimes what I'll do is look at them from above and that can really help you too to determine, hey, is this left eye bulgy or is the right eye sinking? Um, and so it, it would be more obvious looking from above that the right eye was actually the one sinking in as opposed to the left eye being the one that's bulging out. Um, you know, obviously Horner syndrome is something that we see Again, not commonly in conjunction with a cervical disc problem, but it, it's certainly possible and certainly something that we should keep in the back of our minds. Um, lastly, last clinical sign is going to be difficulty breathing. Obviously, this is going to be an emergency, um, so you can have loss of your respiratory function because of a disc problem. Um, you have to be pretty severe. Um, but the phrenic nerve um, comes out of the spinal cord, is formed by the spinal nerves of C5, C7. So with a caudal cervical disc um, extrusion, you can certainly have, um, you know, kind of compression of the phrenic nerve and dysfunction of the phrenic nerve. Again, the phrenic nerve uh, supplies the diaphragm. So if we don't have a phrenic nerve, presumably we can't breathe well. Um, again, this requires emergent intervention. Um, frankly, I like to get these guys into surgery as soon as possible. I like to intubate them as soon as possible um, just to make sure that we're maintaining appropriate ventilation. Um, and again, these guys may require a ventilator during recovery um, as well as, you know, obviously before surgery. So um, when I have a case that presents to me in, in this fashion, and it's not common, but I will typically, you know, express the, the concern to the owner, get them intubated as soon as possible, even if that means that they have to stay intubated to wait for their MRI, for example, or to wait for um, blood work to be finished running before we proceed with an MRI and surgery. Um, I'd much rather stress them out as little as possible um, and, again, make, make sure that they are being ventilated appropriately. Um, so this guy is Max. Max came in to us um, late on a Friday evening for acute tetraplegia. He was, um, again, tetraplegic, had absent posture reactions in all four. Um, and you can see how he's breathing here. Um, so two things I want to point out. Number one, just the kind of 
fish gulping, how he's drawing his lips back to try and pull air in. Um, so not the typical Frenchie in pain that you see that they're panting and they have this upper airway crisis because of their obstruction. Um, he just functionally was unable to breathe. Um, and then secondly, you'll see if you look back at his abdomen, his abdomen is expanding much more than his chest. Um, so when he's breathing, he's kind of what we call abdominal breathing. Um, you could hear, you couldn't hear lung sounds when you listen to his heart and lungs. Um, so obviously that was an emergency. Um, thankfully, Max's people were, were able to help him and he had an MRI and surgery at C45. We will see his MRI later on in the presentation. Um, so he, um, you know, he did very well. He recovered, thankfully didn't need a ventilator, but um, just was a, a very emergent case, one that we wouldn't leave until, you know, the next day. Wouldn't frankly leave um, for any longer than we had to. So we definitely want to see him right away, get him into, you know, MRI and, and surgery right away as well. So that was all our, you know, kind of clinical science information. Obviously, some clinical signs being more severe and more significant than others, um, but kind of the whole gamut of things that you could see. Um, so diagnostic testing or differential diagnoses, excuse me. Um, so there are lots of them, and as you all know, um, different diseases can look exactly the same. It just depends on what part of the nervous system is affected. Um, so inflammatory disease certainly possible in lots of our poster child breeds. So French Bulldog, Shizus, Maltese, Yorkies, Chihuahuas, they're certainly good candidates, you know, to get meningitis or, or myelitis as well. Um, neoplasia, unfortunately, again, in our older, you know, dogs, especially the large breeds, we have to consider a neoplastic process. Discospondylitis as well. Um, again, one of the ones that I keep in mind more commonly for our larger breed dogs, but certainly can affect anyone. Wobbler syndrome, again, larger breed dogs. Um, if we had, you know, let's say a Great Dane come in, um, or a Doberman. We've seen tons of Dobermans with IVDD, but we've also seen tons of Dobermans with Wobbler syndrome. So um, keeping all of our possibilities on the list. Ischemic myelopathy, so um, like an FCE, for example, um, so just where you're getting a loss of blood flow, they can be very acute, can appear painful initially, so um, can kind of mimic a disc as well. Malformation, so atlantal axial subluxation, um, QRE malformation with syringomyelia. Again, poster children breeds are, are going to be all the same for lots of these things. Um, and then finally, trauma. So fractures and luxations or spinal cord contusions, um, certainly possible as well. And, you know, throughout the course of, of my residency, throughout the course of, um, you know, kind of every neurologist's career, um, I think we've seen all of these things um, all present with all of the same clinical signs that I've just described to you. So really important to keep all of the possibilities on our list until we've got that definitive diagnosis. Um, but we still have to remember that not every single dog with neck pain is going to have a disc. So testing, um, so complete neurologic exam, I think I've said it you know, 10 times throughout this lecture, that's going to be one of your most important tests, especially before referral. Um, or if the, you know, the pet parent is unable to commit to referral, um, you know, completing a full neurologic exam and getting a full history is going to be very important. Minimum database is important, mostly just to make sure that the pet is healthy. Um, radiographs are a good screening tool. We'll show you a few in just a moment. Um, and then CT or MRI. MRI is certainly preferable. There are a few reasons why, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. Um, I know I, I said that after I showed you a CT scan, um, but that was the outlier. So um, certainly doing a CT is, is not our first preference, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. So radiographs, um, they're a really good screening tool. There are a few reasons that we use them only as a screening tool. Number one, it can suggest a disc herniation, but can't definitively diagnose IVDD. So Sure, we can have degeneration of the discs, we can have collapsed disc spaces. What I tell my pet parents is um, the radiographs can tell us that that's happened, can't tell us that that's happened yesterday or a week ago or a year ago. Um, and I always tell people, you know, I'm, I'm relatively young. If you looked at my back on radiographs, I probably have some um, collapsed disc spaces as well and I'm, I'm not painful and pretty otherwise happy and healthy. Um, so we don't wanna make our definitive diagnosis based on those radiographs. Um, include the chest in your radiographs, especially if you're sending them over our way, because if we are doing additional testing, we're going to want those. So that's just a little please and thank you side note. 
Um, so if you can get the chest in there reasonably, definitely, um, you know, sounds good to do so. Um, saves the kind of dog from having extra x-rays, saves the client from, you know, an additional cost. Um, and then, of course, if we have one of our, um, you know, kind of less uh, common breeds, let's say a Rottweiler, we know with certainty then they're not going to have a, a chest full of metastatic neoplasia. Um, and so obviously that would be a, a less ideal scenario, but is, is nice to know beforehand. Um, so radiographs downside are that they can be really difficult to position. It's really difficult to get a um, straight cervical radiograph, even for us sometimes, and we do it, you know, every single day. Um, because we have small breed dogs who are seeing most commonly, they're difficult to hold, they're painful, and they don't want to be in the position that we want them to be in. Um, we don't typically sedate before our radiographs if we can help it, um, but obviously if we have to, we have to, but even still with a sedated patient, it can be difficult to get those perfectly straight x-rays. Um, and we usually do two views, so that's why I pull these up both here. Um, these are pretty nice radiographs, and so that's why they, I included them. They're pretty normal. Um, but you can see here, nice and straight, um, we see kind of the wings of the atlas um, align well here. Um, you know, you can see all of your disc spaces nicely. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a nice radiograph. The same with the VD. Um, so you can see everything's pretty well aligned. The head was probably wanting to turn a little bit here. Um, but these are, are pretty good radiographs. You also see here at C34, there's a bit of a reduction in the disc space. Um, you know, so sure, that could be suggestive of a disc problem, but there's no way I would go into surgery based on these alone. Um, and then here, just to, to demonstrate as well, um, you see here this kind of mineralized disc in situ. So yes, that disc is degenerate, but no, that doesn't mean that it is the problem. Um, you see here at C23, there's a collapsed disc space as well. Um, and I would bet that, you know, if, if I had to take a bet that the C23 would probably be the, the more, um, you know, kind of uh, severe, significant problem if this dog had a neck problem. Um, but this is just as, as an example of what you may see on a, a radiograph. All right, so MRI, again, much preferable to CT. Um, so the MRI is, is strongly recommended over CT. Um, you can see bone on the MRI. CT is obviously the superior imaging modality for bone. Um, but the MRI is going to be much better at showing us the soft tissue. So um, pros are that this is the gold standard for imaging the spinal cord. Um, there's great detail of the soft tissue. So the disc, the spinal cord, the nerves. I tell people we'll see the muscles in that area. And we'll kind of see everything that we're worried about in the neck. Um, you know, there, there are dogs who have surprised us that have a, a soft tissue problem as opposed to a um, true spinal cord problem that are painful and, and tetraparotic. Um, recently saw one who had a soft tissue sarcoma that ended up making its way into the spinal canal. Um, so sure, that dog was non-ambulatory tetraparotic. We found the problem, but we're also able on the MRI to get those soft tissues and to get a full picture of the tumor itself. Um, so it does give a, a kind of full general view of the area of interest um, and can also diagnose most of the other possible causes. So um, some of the things like meningitis, myelitis, tumors, um, you know, those are all things that may not show up on a CAT scan. And so the MRI gives us the best chance of getting, you know, the, the diagnosis, even if it's not a slipped disc. Um, and that's why we much prefer it. Um, so cons of an MRI, there's a cost associated. Um, that's often the biggest hurdle for some families um, and realizing that it's it's no small amount of money. Um, you know, but obviously we, you know, we, we try to express that to our pet parents, um, you know. And then the requirement for anesthesia, that can be a, a big downside for some patients. Um, you know, obviously that's why we're doing our pre-anesthetic testing, um, but we often have to balance, especially in our older patients, the risk versus reward if they do have comorbidities, you know, is there a potential that we cause more harm than good by doing the MRI scan? So that's obviously something that'll have to be, you know, discussed with the owner as well. Um, and then again, you can see the bone, but CT is the superior imaging modality for bone. Um, with a disc herniation, this is unlikely to be a problem. Um, but if there is, let's say, a bony tumor, we'll often recommend MRI and CT together. Um, so that's something that we often kind of retrospectively um, will discuss with the owner, you know, either after the MRI is done while they're still here and we can still get a CT scan or, you know, hey, you may consider a CT in the future um, for like radiation planning 
surgery planning, things like that. But all in all, for a disc herniation, probably 999 times out of 1,000, MRI is going to be the recommended test. And then here we have a nice pretty MRI scan of a C23 disc. Um, so you can see here the herniated disc is kind of darker, um, what is called hypointense on our, our T2 weighted image. This is kind of one of our more common images that we use. This gray tube here is the spinal cord. Um, you can kind of see the intervertebral discs here. It's, they're all kind of degenerate, so they would be in these spaces here. Um, but this is obviously a, a very profound herniated disc causing massive spinal cord compression and that puppy uh, absolutely needed needed surgery. Um, so C23 is, is pretty common in small breed dogs, 6-7 is more common in large breed dogs, these more caudal cervical disc herniations um, are definitely more common in our large breed dogs. Um, and on, you know, this is a what's called a, a sagittal image, so kind of a side view. Um, but on our axial images looking into the spinal cord, we can see those nerve roots pretty nicely as well. Um, so treatment options are variable. Um, we have a few. Um, so surgery is, you know, kind of one of the preferred options in the more severe cases. Um, you know, obviously that's going to be case dependent and family dependent. Um, conservative or medical management is certainly reasonable as well. We'll talk about what we do, utilize for conservative management and then how do we decide? Obviously, again, case dependency, um, you know, if the patient is a, a good patient for anesthesia and for, for an extended anesthesia. Um, and then how clinically affected are they? So um, on our kind of grading scale, you know, grade one is the least severely affected. Those dogs have neck pain only. Grade five is our most severely affected. Um, those dogs can't move the legs or feel the toes. Um, that's super rare in the cervical spine, more common in the thoracolumbar spine, but emergent. And frankly, most of those, those dogs are, are near fatality um, when they do present. Those are the dogs that are typically going to have difficulty breathing and things like that. Um, and then obviously grades two, three, and four are kind of in between those two. And for me, any dog who, who cannot walk, so a grade three or above absolutely needs surgery. Any dog who has failed medical management, so if they come to us on three different medications and they're resting and they're still uncomfortable, um, absolutely surgery is, is the indication at that point. Um, so surgery itself, um, so ventral slot is going to be our kind of most common surgical approach. Um, so again, when we approach this, is just kind of a brief summary of what we're doing. So you know what we're doing here. Um, so you'll kind of dissect through the muscles. You'll get through the strap muscles and the longus coli, retracting all of your important things like the trachea and esophagus to the side. Um, and then you will, you know, kind of get through the longus coli and expose the ventral portion of the spine. Um, and then you make this little coin slot in between the, the two bones and the affected disc. Um, so kind of the caudal and, and cranial end plates of those two bones. And this coin slot gives us access to where the disc would be sitting. So I think this picture gives you a, a side view. So whereas this is a ventral view, this is more of a sagittal or side view um, where this blue would be your herniated disc. You're drilling this little coin slot in the disc and the end plates. Um, and the bone a little bit, and then you're kind of able to access and scoop out this kind of ventrally herniated um, disc here, and then we're able to visualize in surgery that the spinal cord is sitting flat, um, you know, like it should be sitting in the spinal canal or vertebral canal here. Um, so obviously this is a schematic drawing here, um, but it's a, it's a pretty good representation of, of what goes on. Um, and is, is usually helpful for people to know because a lot of people are surprised, you know, that the dog has a scar on their neck as opposed to on their back. Um, you know, so that's certainly our, our more common um, approach. And, and again, probably 99 out of 100 cases who have a slip disc in the neck will have a, a ventral slot, maybe even more than that. The alternative is a cervical hemilaminectomy. Um, so again, same as the hemilaminectomy in the back, you've got more musculature on top. Um, so you're kind of dissecting through those muscles to get to the bones underneath here. Um, you can see that you were, um, again, more muscle, just lots of muscle to get through. And then you can finally see in this image here, you expose the dorsal portion of your spine um, and you're able to do a hemilaminectomy just like you would in the back. Um, the downside of this is that it is a more painful procedure um, it's more invasive because there's more muscle to get through. Um, and so, um, you know, these dogs typically require a little bit extra in terms of hospital stay and pain management afterwards, although there's still a good chance of, 
you know, kind of improvement and, and resolution, even if you need a dorsal approach in the cervical spine, um, it's just a little bit of a, a bigger surgery for them. You also, as a reminder, have your nuchal ligament here, which we try our very best to preserve. Um, and so that, that creates a little bit of a, an obstacle during surgery where just like the trachea and the esophagus, you have to retract that off to the side. Um, so this is actually Max's MRI from the previous image. He was the puppy who was having trouble breathing. Um, so you can see spinal cord is kind of on this side here. Hopefully you can see my pointer. Um, and then the disc is all on the side here. Um, so this kind of mixed bright and, and hypo-intense or hyper-intense and hypo-intense material over here, pressing on the spinal cord from the left side. Um, as you can imagine, going ventrally would be really difficult to get this stuff up here. So we did have to take a cervical approach in this little pup. Um, and again, we're able to remove all that disc material, relieve the compression, and um, he went home just a few days later feeling a lot better. Um, so conservative management, medications and rest, focusing on the medications. Um, so pain medication is certainly a big part of that plan. Um, we like gabapentin, tramadol. I know, you know, tramadol has some um, kind of questionable research recently, but um, we feel that that's a relatively good combination of medications to um, control a more mild to moderate pain. Um, for dogs with a chronic neck pain whose, whose owners either um, just can't commit to doing an MRI or who aren't a good candidate for MRI or for whatever reason that they're not having an MRI or surgery. Um, I'll add in some amantadine. We also like like that for some wind-up pain. Um, and again, that's kind of a, a similar medication to ketamine, but in an oral form. Um, muscle relaxers, so definitely those dogs with those really tight necks and, and muscle spasms in the necks. Um, Valium is, is preferable, in my opinion, to methocarbamol. I've just seen a better response to Valium. Um, so, you know, certainly utilizing Valium um, is appropriate, especially in combination with these other meds. Um, lots of people say, gosh, my dog's just gonna be totally zonked. That's okay, because we want them to be resting. Um, and then anti-inflammatories. So I don't prescribe anti-inflammatories to every case. Um, the more severely affected cases that elect medical management or require medical management, um, I am not afraid of using steroids. I feel that they work better than non-steroidals in most cases. Um, so just a short anti-inflammatory course of steroids, um, usually kind of three days on, an, on a you know one mg per, per day dose and tapering from there. Um, and usually we're doing a seven to 10 day course of medicine. What I tell my pet owners is that, you know, if they're they're not responding in those seven to 10 days, the likelihood is that we'll have to switch gears and consider a more aggressive approach um, because usually they will start to get better in that time. Um, now rest is the most important part, in my opinion, of the conservative approach. Um, so this poor little dachshund was um, probably had a disc somewhere. Um, so we recommend four weeks in a crate or a small playpen no running, no jumping, no playing during that time, no stairs. Um, and that's often the hardest part of this approach is that most pet owners say, gosh, I don't want to see him in a crate or he hates being in his crate. Um, you know, but it is the kind of requirement to give that nucleus time to, uh, excuse me, that annulus time to heal. So if you remember that hole in the annulus, and um, we've got to give that some time to kind of scar and heal so that the rest of the disc material stays where it's supposed to be and whatever has already extruded has some time to scar down as well and become a bit less irritating to the spinal cord. Um, during the crate rest period, we want them only going outside for potty breaks on a leash and a chest harness. Any dog with a slip disc in the neck, um, we recommend a chest harness as opposed to a neck collar um, for the rest of their life, frankly. Um, and then prognosis. So um, most dogs have a really good chance of getting better and walking again. Um, with a slip disc. So with surgery, for any dog who's agreed one to four, or again, as long as they can feel their toes, they've got a 90 to 95% chance of walking again and being pain-free. Um, certainly really good chances. Um, for grade five, we've only got a 50% chance of walking again if surgery is performed within 24, 48 hours of losing the ability to feel the toes. So again, that's much more serious. Those are the ones that we're rushing in in the middle of the night to do. Um, just because we want to give them the best chances. And, and those are the ones where, you know, immediate referral is certainly important for, you know, for the best chances. Um, the post-operative rest period is imperative for a good outcome. So um, just like in the conservative management approach, we need them to be rested for a few weeks after surgery, um, just to make sure that they're healing, that that defect in the disc is healing, um, and that, you know, we have good chances of this not happening again. 
remembering that there's still some disc left over in situ where it should be. Um, so we don't want that extra disc left over to rupture out after surgery. Um, and some pets may benefit from rehab. Um, certainly I have lots of people who take either the surgical or conservative approach that ask about rehab. Um, so whether that is, you know, acupuncture, laser therapy, um, water treadmill, you know, um, obstacle courses, all of that. And we do offer some of those things here. And, and certainly the dogs who can't walk or are having difficulty walking um, are, it's more of a requirement for their recovery or um, more highly recommended for their recovery to kind of speed up their recovery and provide a more full functional recovery. Um, but lots of pet owners who have dogs who come in, even for pain only, will be interested in those modalities um, just to kind of give an overall um, best chance of getting better. And so I, I certainly advocate for those things in conjunction with the other things that we've talked about. Um, and then the prognosis for conservative management, so obviously is dependent on the severity. Um, so between about 50 and 70% chance of recovery for the less severely affected grades. Um, so grades one and two, grade one again is neck pain only, grade two is ambulatory, but with um, a tetraparesis or ataxia. Um, for anything that's grade three, um, you know, which is a, a non-ambulatory tetraparesis, um, about a 50% chance or less of recovery. Those are the ones that I'm reaching for steroids if they're not having a, an MRI and or surgery. Um, and then for a grade four and five, the prognosis is pretty guarded with medical management alone. Um, so for conservative, again, owner compliance is key. Um, so really important to stress to your owners that create rest, which they most likely won't want to do, but that's okay. Um, and, you know, that's most important in my opinion. I always tell people, if you take nothing out of this conversation today, just remember to keep your dog very strictly rested for that four week time frame. Um, and then dogs who are conservatively managed, unfortunately do have a 50% chance of recurrence. Um, so definitely a, a higher rate of recurrence than with our surgical cases where we're in the 10 to 15% range. Um, so lastly, um, some lifestyle modifications. I think we'll probably have to skip Max's case again, unfortunately, um, but lifestyle modifications. Um, so avoiding high impact activities like jumping on and off of furniture and um, for any chondrodystrophic dog or dog with a history of a slip disc, um, using a, again, a chest harness instead of a collar, no tug of war. That one's not the most intuitive lifestyle modification. Um, so um, obviously again, tug of war and other higher impact rough plays. Um, will put extra stress on the spine, especially in the neck. So um, for any of our pups with a slip disc in the neck, I, I tell the owners, find something else that they like to do. You know, if they have a toy that they're, you know, kind of alligator rolling with when they play with it, um, probably find a different toy that they like because that's going to put them at, at a higher risk. Weight loss and weight management. Um, so we want dogs to be kind of on the leaner side. So I typically shoot for a body condition score of four out of nine instead of five out of nine in these dogs because less weight is less stress on the spine. Um, use of ramps, of course, so or small steps. Um, the ramps or the steps should be um, kind of carpeted or padded with a high traction surface, so either carpet or rubber, um, so that the likelihood of slipping and sliding off of those is low. Um, and then for any dog with a slip disc or propensity for a slip disc, um, I always recommend crate rest when unsupervised or rest in a safe area of the home where they can't be tempted to jump on and off of things, go up and down stairs, um, just to, again, minimize our risk. And, and those things won't prevent completely, but will certainly minimize the likelihood that we have another slip disc in the future. Um, so unfortunately, we'll have to skip over Max again, because I think I'm close to be out, being out of time. Um, but this was Max's MRI. He had a hydrated nucleus pulposus extrusion. So actually a jelly disc that slipped out. You can see it's pressing on the spinal cord here. Um, so just a, a different type of disc extrusion, um, you know, that was causing compression, but we will kind of move on for time's sake.